Good morning, everyone. Happy pre-Friday. How are we? Some guy, woo, 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 or uh, uh, uh. <laughs> probably a little bit of both, right? <laughs> well, thanks everybody for being here. Um, how many of you raise your hand um, are just, when you wake up in the morning, you go, are we really almost at Thanksgiving? I don't know about you, but this year has literally sped by. Um, I feel like we just had a meeting like months ago where we were virtual because we couldn't come out and see each other. And now we're about to end 2023. So I know it's been, if it's been that way for us, I know it's that way for you. Um, but what that's, what that means to me is, you know, like I say to people, you know, things happen fast when you're having fun. Aren't we having fun? Yeah, right, look at you. No, They're all looking at me like, yeah, right, Saretha, who are you talking to? Isn't this fun? Well, I will tell you what's fun for me, the opportunity to get out of my office and do what my staff call field trips, to get into buildings and see babies, right? You know, my office is at 1615 Chicago Avenue and there's not a baby to be found. And so when I'm able to get out of the building and go in and have a little one who is smiling at me and making me understand why I do what I do every day, that's what brings me joy. And I'm saying that because in the last few months, I've actually been able to get out and do some of that. And it, it just brings back the why I have been doing this for a lot of years. <laughs> Actually, I've been, my my youngest is turning 38 and I was, she was in utero when I started early learning, if that tells you anything. Um, and that's how long I've been doing this. And yeah, that baby went to work with me at a Head Start program two weeks after birth. Because my site director came to my bedside and said, guess what, I have a new job. And I'm like, oh, okay. She's like, no, I have a new job and it starts like today. And I came to bring you the keys. And I'm like, do you not notice that you're in a hospital room? Um, and I just had a brand new baby and she's like, but they offered me, I said, okay, let's not even discuss it. Give me the keys. Let's just move on. I got out of the hospital and within two weeks was back in my site with baby in basket under desk. We could do that back then. Y'all can't do that now, right? <laughs> Things have changed since then. But my point is it's been a long time that I found value in making sure that our youngest citizens, which are our infants and toddlers all the way through, are being served by people like you because it is what you do every day that makes a difference in the lives of these children in Chicago. And if you don't think about that, I do every day. When I get a chance to talk to you, when I get a chance to see babies, I'm constantly reminded of your value add to society. And I, if nobody else has said that to you, I wanna say that to you this morning. There's no one who can do what you do better, all right? You are the prime source of children feeling valued in Chicago right now, because if you open up the news any given moment, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that our children are a value. The way we're losing family members, it doesn't say that the children are valued, but you do that every day. And those moms and dads and others who are bringing those babies in are bringing them to you because they what? They trust you. So you've built trusting relationships that are lasting for some people. And it may be the first time that they've ever had a trusting relationship in their life. So what I'm saying is please don't take anything for granted on what you and your staff are doing every day. You are building our future, both in Chicago and wherever any of these folks might land. That's what you're doing every day. Our lives are, will all be better because of you. What I used to say when I had a youth program was I thank them because they were gonna grow up and they were gonna become income providers, right? They were going to get jobs. And then I would follow up with, and you'll be paying my social security. And I just messed up this screen again. <laughs> and I had one who came back to me recently, gave me a big hug and said, thank you for everything that you did. And guess what? You're not retired yet, but my investment is in there for you when you retire, because I've been working for seven years now. And so he heard me and now he's working and I'm ready to retire. Anybody else? But you, you all aren't, aren't old enough. Put your hands down. 
But again, I just want to thank you for everything that you do every day. And again, I just want to constantly be that voice that says to you that I understand what you do. First of all, is heavy. And I know it's hard and I know it's a challenge, but I also know that what you do makes a difference. And I just wanted to make sure that I had a moment to do that with you this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into my agenda items. Um, and at some point, my staff who's in a meeting in another room with Office of Head Start, they'll get out of that meeting and be able to come into the room. And so hopefully by the time I finish, they'll be able to walk in here. If not, I'll talk about something else. <laughs> but the first thing on the board, it says under enrollment mandate. And it's all three of our federal grants, our Head Start, Early Head Start, Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, and also our Early Head Start Expansion Grant. We are under-enrolled on all three. One, I can immediately understand the under-enrollment, and that is our EHSCCP grant, because all slots are not allocated. There were people who actually gave back some EHSCCP. So I can kind of understand that one. But when it comes to all the other grants, I have to ask you, the same question the region was just asking me, What's going on with City of Chicago and zero to three? Because what we're struggling with is enrolling zero to three across all your programs. And it's not just the federal, but also the state. We are seriously struggling here. And so I am asking you questions right now. Why do you think that is? Anybody who wants to put up their hand, give me any ideas that you think of things that's happening while you're having some issues with zero to three. There you go. See, Tracy, go ahead. When you say staffing, staffing meaning? This is absolutely true. So she said staffing. Um, who's in here on my team? Who's, oh, you're sitting right there. Take notes. I know you're about to eat. Sorry, Jocelyn. <laughs> staffing, anybody else? What else do you think you're struggling with with zero to three enrollment specifically? You got another one? Okay. So thanks for bringing that up. I just said that to Kathy Gray, who is my regional specialist, who's also over city of Chicago at the office of Head Start. Like I said to her, because of where we are right now, I am going to send out to all of you a clarification policy. Years ago, our saying as city of Chicago that we wanted everybody and we required bachelor's degrees on the federal grant, right? We did that at a, at a time when what? There were plenty of people out there, right? We weren't going through what we're going through right now. How many of you are understaffed or have at least one vacancy? Everybody see around the room, almost everybody's hands gone up, right? Because we have vacancies across the board. I'm looking at your budgets. I see vacancies, so I know what's going on. But I will say to you, same thing I just said to her, I am going to do a policy clarification because what it has said for years is that for our Head Start grant, you must have a bachelor's degree. What that will do for me, for a monitor who comes in, they're going to hold me in compliance with a bachelor's degree for all of them, which means we got a problem, right? Because I know some of your grants, you don't have a teacher who has a bachelor's degree. You may have someone with an AA in that classroom and other things. But it also means that that clarification that you're going to get states that that individual who you might put in that classroom must have the opportunity to have a professional development plan, active professional development plan, because we've looked at some in their what I call stale, meaning nobody's looked at it in years. Nobody's kept up with whether or not the person's been in school, taking a class, doing anything differently. I can't authorize it unless it is an active professional development plan where someone on your staff has the opportunity and responsibility to be following up and checking off what they have completed each and every semester or quarter based on where they're enrolled. You have got to keep it up to date. If you're not keeping it up to date, then this won't work. And that's been part of what has stalled us doing this is because when we look at professional development plans, they're two years old and there's no update. That won't fly. And so in your clarification statement, it will talk to you about what city of Chicago is authorizing, but it will also say what you must do in order for this to be allowed in your house. Anyone who's not doing that, if my staff are coming out and they're seeing that you've got a professional development plan and there's no movement, then we're gonna have to talk to you about what we're going to do. 
because that's going to get us all in more trouble than we're already in. Is that going to help any of you? Yes or no? I don't have to write it if you say no. <laughs> but I know it will because I'm looking right now at what you have. And so I do want to work with all of you as best I possibly can to try to make sure that you're able to get people in your classrooms. And I understand the issue, Tracy, where you want to hire, but what you're looking at are people who don't have that minimum that we say is necessary. As a result of that, you're saying no to them. I want to give you an opportunity to say yes. But when you say yes, you have to take the opportunity to do the work behind that. Are we all in agreement that we'll do that? And that's on the federal grant. Let me say, I don't have the same flexibility when it comes to a PFA teacher. You do have a minimum of a bachelor's degree with a credential level five minimum. And that's good until 2026, but they also need to be actively enrolled in a program leading towards a Pell. That's the minimum that I can do for state, but we can talk about what we're gonna do with federal, okay? I saw your hand and then I'll come out. Yes. Well, we don't have COPA anymore right now. Let me say this, I know. We are right now finishing the HR module for CARES. And I say right now, probably as I'm standing here in front of you, uh, my staff are looking at it and seeing whether or not it is working the way that we intended to work. And so right now, and I'm saying this and please hear me, yes, today you can put things into COPA. What then will happen is we will be moving things from COPA into CARES. What doesn't transport over into CARES, we'll be working with you to make sure we can get them uploaded into CARES if it doesn't automatically transfer over. Our issue right now are documents moving from care, COPA to CARES. To your point, putting that in eDocs or wherever, we're having an issue with whether or not those things are gonna automatically transfer over and we're working with our vendor on that. But right now, yes, put them in there so I can see them, so I can have them, okay? Second question. Twenty-five, twenty-six, which means that you have another year you've been granted the governor when he did his expansion. And the question is about the ability to things. EDOC's putting things in COPA. Yes, you can still put things in COPA. I want to do that out loud so everybody hears what our question was. The other one is about the pill. Right now, what the governor did when he gave the expansion, he also, what we said to him is, please don't expand without talking to ISBE because we already don't have enough people. And so you can say you want more, but we don't have enough teachers to do this with Appel. And 2024 was the exact same time that it was coming to an end for that authority at the same time he wanted to expand. So ISBE did give an extension of teachers who have a BA level five to 2026. That's also going out in the clarification statement. So yes, they have more time, but the issue is they have to be actively pursuing what's necessary. I know that there were people who were given that, uh, that granted uh, ability who never moved. 2024 came and they hadn't even enrolled. And so now if they're working for you and they don't enroll, they shouldn't be in your classroom because you, they are never going to meet it. They're not going to meet the mandate and you're going to have a problem because at the end of the day, without the, a teacher with the right credential in a professional PFA classroom, those classrooms are not countable. When I do my report to ISBE or to CPS first and then to ISBE, when they look at that, if we don't have the right teacher in there, those classrooms are not counted, which means our enrollment then is what? It's cut because that 17 or 20 kids that you have are not counted as CPS. They can't count them if they don't have the right credential. And believe me, they're looking at every one of the classrooms and asking us for what the credentials are. We give them the enrollment, we come back, we give them the credentials and they start doing this, okay? And that's where we are with that side of it. We can't make any changes in that. That, that leverage there is to get people in program, get them in school, get them to get their Pell so that they can do that by 2026. Yes, yes, and yes, and we're aware of that. 
Um, what has been uh, helpful is when agencies, and I'm going to say it out loud because data is one thing, but your experience is a different one. What I've asked agencies to do is send me a letter on your letterhead stating that is what you've gone through. Okay. Because again, let me say this. We know the data is there. We can see, and so can CPS. They can see where a person worked because they were in that system and they can see where they work now. So yes, the data is clear that there are individuals leaving you and going directly to CPS. There's no if, and, and buts about that. But when I'm in the meeting with them, they deny it. Okay, I need something from you that says that. What I did before is I went in and as we were talking about it and they were going, that's really not the issue. And I'm like, read this one, read this one, read this one. And at that point it was like, I'm, I can't argue with what you're saying with what I'm seeing. And we need to talk about what we're doing, okay? One of the issues is salary, right? Every time we do something with salary, so does CPS because they're all union. And so what do you think the minimum salary is now for a Pell teacher at CPS? Well, the average may be that across K-12, but I will tell you the Pell right now entry is 61. How many of you are paying 61 at entry? How many hands are up? Only two in the room. Three at entry. I said at entry. First time teacher. How many of you are paying 61,000? Only a couple of you look around the room. We're not competing with what CPS is doing and that's part of the issue. What else does CPS have that you don't have? What? And, and, and pension. And so we're, we are not, it's not equal, okay? Not, not that we're getting married, but we're not equally yoked, y'all, okay? <laughs> And as a result of that, those differences become glaring for individuals when they're looking at their households and trying to make a living, right? What happened to in, in, in America, definitely in Illinois, the cost of living went up. If somebody can get more money, guess where they went for more money? You had people who left you to go to where? Walmart. You had people who left you to go where? They're, they're driving some of those trucks around, Amazon, okay? I, I rode with somebody who I used to have in my classroom when she was driving an Uber. And I'm like, why are you driving this Uber? She said, I'm gonna talk to you as I'm driving because I don't have time to pull over this race, but I wanna tell you exactly what. And she literally gave me the whole story about why she was choosing an Uber. I said, I just wanna hear it from you. Part of it was the flexibility. She's a mom, single mom. She could get her kids to school. She could drive her Uber. She could be home. And what she was netting in between was more than we could pay. It's hard. You are in competition, not just with CPS, but with big box and other industries that are paying more and also have the flexibility where she could say, I'm going to take two months off, right? And so because we're not equally yoked, we've got to figure out something different, y'all. So we're going to have to start talking about what else we have that makes us a value add for these folks who want to come into early learning right? Because we've got to give them a reason to do this and a reason to stay with it. And that's, those are the kinds of things that I'm going to come back to you because I did have another hand over here and then I'm gonna come back. Yes. So what I, and I will in the clarification statement, talk about all of those things, because our reality is based on what they have when they start determines what the time frame is and what organizations should be doing. I know I used to is my, I had my staff come up with a, is this a one year or a two year plan? Okay. And if it's a one year plan, the start date and the end date, go back here, here, and here. Don't wait till the end date to talk to that person. Cause then it's after the fact. If it's a two-year plan, you got to have all of those intervals when you're talking. And if they get off course, you got to be able to document the why. It's not just that I'm going to hold you to, they can't do it anymore. As long as we're actively trying to do this, my point for the federal government is they will accept us trying, but they won't accept us not doing anything. And that's why it has to be documented on our side and yours. And that's what we're going to work on. Okay. Yes, ma'am.
Well, I'm I'm looking at both. And how many of you received my email asking you to send me all your credentials for Head Start and EHSCCP? That's part of my looking at this. And the only reason I didn't say expansion, because guess what? Those of you who have expansion also have one. So, and you gave them to me before. So my point is this, I need to look across every one of your sites is what I'm doing right now and trying to determine what my gaps are so that I can write this correctly. And so what I'm already seeing is I know vacancies from your budget, but I'm also looking at what credentials people are putting on there that are misaligned. And so from that, it will help me better detail what that's going to be and is gonna help you, I hope, write up what you're gonna do with your PD plans in your programs. Um, because some people need a lot more work than others, and some may be a few classrooms away. And some people have given that to my staff, but some people are nowhere near and haven't been in school in a long time. And that person may be saying to you, I don't wanna go back. Writing a PD plan for that person is what? It's, waste, it's, it's a waste of your time. That person is already saying to you, they're not gonna do this. You gotta be able to say what you're going to now do differently. Okay, and I'm asking everybody, please don't write a, P a PD plan for somebody. Work with them to write their PD plan and make them invest in it, make them agree to it and make them understand that you're gonna be working with them on the plan. That is not just something that's going into a file that is active and we're gonna constantly follow through because if you don't, they don't, okay? How many people were in school in COVID and how many people re-entered school after COVID? Totally different. What other questions? You had another one behind? Yes. Linda? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Oh, it's, it's all over people's paperwork. The CPS was the reason. So I don't have access into gateways. Yeah, right. Well, let me say this. I don't have a lens into gateways anymore. I did when I was at Carol Robertson Center for Learning. Oh, I'm sorry, that's where I used to work. I don't have it at City of Chicago. You have it. And those are things I'm gonna be asking you for because I need to get from you as much information as I can possibly have to tell this story, right? Because if we're not gonna get there, we gotta not get there together, everybody on the same boat, but everybody needs to understand what the issues are across the board so that we're working to collaboratively together. How many of you have staff that are currently in the Chicago Early Learning Workforce Scholarship? How many of you would have more if there was more money? How many of you just say it's hard and I can't do it? See, nobody's hand went up. But what I'm getting from staff is different. What they're saying is nobody's encouraging me and nobody's agreeing with me to go back to school. I'm not pointing at anybody and I'm not saying, I'm just telling you that people talk and they don't necessarily tell everything the way that you and your agreements and conversations are having with them. That's what's being heard out there are those kinds of messages. And what I wanna do is change the message to your message and have it be heard by everyone. Yes. how often it should be, it should be completed for them. They should, it should be an active plan that can live over the life of them going for whatever it is. For example, if all I'm doing is, if I need a class, for example, one of the examples, I just needed a class to finish my degree. Once I finish my degree, I should have another plan. We're re everybody's required to have a professional development plan. It should never end, but we should be able to meet goals. Once you meet a goal, you should develop and design the next goal and does it develop and design the next goal. The goal should include if I'm seeking a degree and also what professional development training I need as a, as a staff here. All of that should be woven into that so that I know what kinds of things I can come to you and say, I heard about this training, can I go to that? Remember, we talked about it in my PD plan as an example. Yes. It applies to everybody who works for you. It even applies for your executive directors, CEOs. They should have professional development plans too. I have one, I just can never do it. Any other questions about that before I move on? 
So we know we're under enrolled. We know staff is an issue. We're going to give a policy clarification. It's going to help out some. But what it's not going to do is not going to fix your marketing and recruitment. It's not going to fix that. Those are things you've got to work on, and we're going to work on with you. I know uh, Claire Dime, Ken, and his team has already worked with some of you on marketing and recruitment. We've got to be actively recruiting all the time. Recruitment should be every day, not just a day, not just in July, not just in August. It should be constant recruitment for making sure you're finding every available family and every available child getting them enrolled in your program. Because if you're not, somebody else is. Correct? Yes, ma'am. What do you mean as a timeline? Okay, so you're telling me to go back to my office and write it now? Is that what you're saying? So you're not going to get it to day trace. I'm going to tell you, you're not. <laughs> but I will try to work on something. If nothing else, if I send out a, a policy statement email and follow it with the document, I might be able to do that. But what I want you to hear from me is I'm going to work to clarify some of that so that you have more opportunities to bring people into your house. But what that also means is going to be more work for you because you then have to work with them to keep them moving forward on this professional development plan. Okay. Ken, I saw your hand. Yes. So we're going to figure out that retro date, aren't we, Ken? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and one of the things that you need to understand when I looked at your grant applications, let's see, how long ago was that? It was evident in your grant applications that you had somewhat vacancies and that's back to August, if that helps you understand where I'm going here. <laughs> All right. I'm going to move on unless I see another hand regarding this one going once, twice. All right. Co corrective action updates. We were in a compliance period. And the compliance period had to do with two incidents and also reporting. Reporting means that individuals who are funded by us were not reporting to us what is the requirement. Immediately meaning same day. And so what we did require was everyone's agency send us back a document which we labeled C12. In that C12, it was required that there would be a board signature and a policy signature. I just need all of you to know those documents also went to Office of Head Start. They didn't just sit with me. We included those in our grant application. Why? Because we've been talking about this, but yet we were not getting everyone to report. So those documents are in my hand. When we have a monitoring visit, we will be going through those. We'll be talking about the why behind it. But the big why is same day is same day, right? What we're asking you to do if something happens, regardless of what it is, let us determine whether or not it needs to be reported to Office of Head Start. And I thank you, I thank you, I thank you because we are getting a lot of reports. So let me say, people are reporting. It's not that you're not, but I just wanna remind everybody what we mean by same day. If today is the 10th, right? And something happened on the 10th, I needed to know it on the 10th with an email that said, this occurred at our site and then you have 24 hours to follow up with, with a report. But you have to at least notify my staff that something occurred. That then is the date by which we start our tracking with you is the date of receipt. But if my data receipt is seven days later, I'm already off track. If it's reportable to Head Start, guess what? I've got a non-compliance that's inching towards another deficiency. And so it has to be same day. I'm not saying that you have to give me a 25 day, 25 page report that day, but you have to report it. Any questions about that from anybody in the room? No questions. With the compliance period, it also meant that we needed to go out to sites. I thank everyone for welcoming my staff and me um, and my staff into your sites as we came in to do visits. Um, I will say that there were some sites that were not welcoming. Just gonna say it. And some of my staff were like, why are you here? Who are you? No, you can't go in our classrooms. That's an issue because we fund your whole program. Now, if you have a classroom that's not funded by us, you can say not that classroom. But if you have a classroom that's funded by us, you got to go, this is your classroom. Okay? It can't be a no. 
It cannot be a no. Does everybody understand that? Part of our obligation and responsibility for being a funded entity that does not directly operate anything, we have to have ability to get into the sites to monitor, to visit, and determine whether or not you are operating within Head Start and state standards. A piece of paper says one thing, visually seeing is something totally different, right? My team has to be out there. I will tell you, we're not gonna stop. We're gonna continue. We'll be in your house, we will be visiting. We will be up close and personal, we'll be coming out and I'm gonna do more as soon as I can get past a certain date so that we can see more of my, through my own lens as well. But I need everybody here to make sure that your staff at your sites understand it can never be a no that DFSS can't come in your building. That just can't happen. I'm gonna say this, if DFSS can't come in the building, DFSS can't what? I can't fund that building because I don't know what's happening on the other side of the door and I cannot be held accountable for something that's not right. And so what I will do again, the staff are gonna come out so far, so good. I haven't heard another one, but I'm saying in this room that it can never be a no, right? We might not get the biggest smile. Sometimes, you know, I, I probably get a bigger smile than some other people. I come in and they go, oh, the deputy commissioner's here. And I'm like, yeah. My staff, they go, oh, but we're all the same. They're there on behalf of me when I can't be there. I need them to be able to get in, to be able to see, to be able to, in some cases, smell and understand what's going on in programs so that we can make the right decisions on our side about how to support you. If I can't see it, I can't tell you what support I can have for you, but that's part of my job is to take all of that information and then try to figure out how I can help you operate your programs what else you need in order to make sure that these are quality programs every day. And so please, let's work together on that. Again, the compliance period um, closed on the 10th. That was for Head Start, Early Head Start and Early Head Start CCP. I am here with you. So if the phone is ringing from Office of Head Start saying they're ready for a monitoring visit, I'm not there. I don't know it. I'll know when I get back to the office, but I'm telling you it could be any day. That's why we needed to have our feet in your programs, because what I also understand, and I'm gonna say this to all of you, what they've done before is they've done follow-up visits virtually, but I also understand that they are now moving to do them in person. What that would mean is they will be coming into your what? Into your sites and classrooms. So again, the other thing that your staff can't say to a federal review person is that they can't come in. And so my concern is if they're telling DFSS no, what are they going to do to a monitoring person? They would do the exact same thing, and that's going to be a huge issue. So make sure you talk to your staff about being welcoming and allowing those who have a right to come in to come into your house. Any questions about that? So I do expect them to come. I don't know when. You will know when I know. But when I do know, we expect them to maybe convert, um, come out physically and go into your classrooms where they will be observing to see whether or not your classrooms are compliant and their focus is health and safety. They're looking for health and safety. They're looking to see whether or not your teachers are correctly interacting with your children, meaning that they're not grabbing, pulling, holding uncomfortably, snatching, talking to children inappropriately, using the wrong voice. I could give you all of those, but you all know what I'm talking about. They can't witness any of that in your classrooms when they're there, all right? And so we're going to go back over it. I, I sent out a document to get your background checks and also your um, staff credentials. You're also going to be requir required to give us some additional information as we move through this process. So I hand. Yes, ma'am. We're working, we're working with our staff on some of that. I understand what your request is. And I'm, I'm talking to my staff, but I will tell you in this particular instance, what we were asking them to do was to go out and then we had a debrief meeting every day at four o'clock where they needed to have that information right there in front of them so that they go on a whirlwind, talk about what kinds of things they saw that day. So we could say, you go back tomorrow or you go ahead, everything sounds good. We needed to do that through this process and through this period and we got it done, but we are looking at our system to make sure that you have something to work from at your sites as well. Okay. So compliance period is closed. We could have a follow-up review any day. So when you go back, if you're Head Start, Early Head Start, or Early Head Start CCP, on your own, make sure your staff are going in and making sure your classes are ready to be reviewed, to be visited, and to be monitored. Any questions from anyone? All right. 
health and safety module. Thank you, Ken and team, for getting that done for us. Woo! I know everybody's like, more work, more work, right? The reason that we've created it is this exact same reason, is that we were having health and safety issues. And we wanted to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to understand what we mean by health and safety. It's a lot more embedded in there than just keeping a classroom safe. It's about mandated report or it's about reporting. All of that's in there so that everybody is getting the same information. But what we have to have is all of your staff go through it. They do have to complete it with an 80% or better, or they won't be able to finish it. We will then have some one-on-ones. And so as I'm getting reports, I will discern and understand whether or not we need to do some face-to-face -face trainings with people based on their inability to make it through those modules. I can see leadership staff in there. Yes, I'm seeing who's in it. I can see leadership staff have signed on. I can see that there are some people who signed on, but not so much. I need everybody in it. Today, I'm saying everybody. I'm moving past just federal. I'm saying everybody. Everybody meaning everybody, meaning all the state entities as well, need to do the health and safety module. Are there any questions about that? By the 10th, I needed to make sure my federal ones were in there. Now I'm saying we need everybody at all your sites to go through the health and safety module. And again, they do have to finish it at 80% or better. If they don't, then we are going to be looking to see what kinds of training and support we need to put out into community to make sure that our classrooms are operating safely. Questions? Yes. Everybody who is paid for on the grant needs to take it. Everybody, okay? If you are federally funded, there is a threshold for salary and some people are not on there. But if they're on the grant, they should be taking it. Why? Because they are responsible for it. They're accountable for it, okay? Linda? It is a little intense, isn't it? Great. Well, it hasn't gone out there for everyone. You're hearing it for the first time from me today. No, what was in there was about help, the help. We were meeting our compliance period for Head Start, Early Head Start, and Early Head Start CCP. I'm saying to you today, compliance period has closed. I need everybody now to go into the system and get it done. You're hearing it first out of my mouth. All righty. Any other questions? Yes, back and then front. It includes PI, it includes home visiting. It doesn't say PI specific, it doesn't say anybody specific. Specific is just as health and safety, all right? Off the top of my head, I'm going to say no, but I, I will talk to Ken and we'll put something else out there. But let me say this. If your home visitor is in someone's home, they have a reliance and a responsibility being a mandated reporter. That's what's in the training. It's your responsibility for that. If you're in a home and, for example, you're supervising your home visitor and your, your home visitor is inappropriate, you're mandated to report that right? But you're also supposed to be working with them to make sure that they understand appropriate and inappropriate, right? And so that's what the training is all about, is making sure that we all understand that, regardless of where we're serving that family, how we're touching that family always has to be appropriate and quality. Okay. Next, Dan. Oh, yeah, tomorrow. I just like saying things like that. Um, I haven't given a due date. We're going to put out something in CSD update that talks about that. I just needed everybody to understand now it's time for us to move forward and everyone to get started. Okay. Yes. What is the, next link? the link is going to come back out in the CSD update so that everybody, because we were being a little bit more restrictive on it, but we're going to send it out so that everybody can access it. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you. So I sent out the CRCs and I sent out credentials. When we're looking at um, the background checks, 
Staff should not be hired before what? Before a clearance, correct? And so if that is occurring on the documents that we're seeing, staff are gonna follow up with you to talk to you about the fact that you are operating outside of protocol and standard because teachers or staff are not supposed to be hired until a clearance happens, right? I've already seen some where that was not the case. So that's an issue. I haven't seen them all. I'm gonna be transparent. I got a lot in my email box, but I haven't gone through all of them. I did open up a couple and I went, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, and so we know that we have some corrections to make and we have some work to do. We also have some people who are going to need to go be background check because they're at right at that five year mark. Um, so this is helping us look at that and come up with the date for the next background check cycle as well. But please make sure that your staff who are sending these in are looking at your files and making sure. And I'm going to give you an example of what we've had to do before. I'm not trying to fix anything here. But if, for example, you hired a staff and they worked in a child care classroom and you had them hired for two months while they worked in a child care classroom, once you got clearance, you moved them into a Head Start contract, the Head Start date that you moved them is the date of hire for me, okay? Which would mean that clearance came when? Before hire. If you're working with a partner, for example, and your partner site you started working with them was September, but they had background checks in October, it cleared before, it did not. If they didn't get their background checks until after they came to you. But if they got background checks before you partnered with them and they had clearances on file, then they're good if you write a contract with them in September. But if you now background check them in October, guess what is going to be what? Out of compliance. So your responsibility is for, to work with whomever you're partnering with to make sure those staff have current background checks before you do what? sign a partner agreement. Any questions about that? And you've got to care carefully look at that to make sure you're not making any mistakes. They want it every three years. We're trying to get it to be every five years. I'm still working with them on that. And so there's going to be clarification from CPS on that one as we move forward. Any other questions? Yes. There was a disallow cost because the statute wasn't being followed, right? right? So there, yes, there was a disallow cost. I will tell you since the disallow cost, we implemented a background check system where we were sending people through so we wouldn't be going through that, okay? But beyond that, there's a date of hire that precedes the date of the law. And some people are still working here from then. And I do have, for example, I can't remember whose background check it said, it was, they, they understand if those background checks precede that date, okay? And so we're notating those kinds of things because at the end of the day, some people have been with us, like I said, I've been here for 38 years, working and head started one level or another. Um, and so my first background check would definitely be what? Really old. Um, but I've been background checked multiple times since then. And so my first one may have been out of standard, but everything else needs to comply. Okay. But we're catching whatever we're catching now and working with people to fix whatever that is. And where we can, we are. All right. Because we don't want to have what you just said, which is disallow cost. Disallow cost then was they would they would just come back and take money back. Right now they're taking grants. It's a big difference. Okay, because back then we also did not have the five um, reasons why they would take a grant away, right? We weren't living under that. That was in 2010. Go back to 2008 is when that happened. Go back to 2010, they instituted a statute that said, if you're, in de if you're deficient, we can do what? Cause you to go through recompete, having done that. And we could also take your grant. And so the whole, we're living in a whole different world right now. And we have to really be careful in what we're documenting and how. And we're going to work with everybody to make sure um, that our documents are correct as we move forward. All right. Credentials. You're going to get a policy statement. 
that policy statement is going to help with what I'm receiving on credentials as well, because people don't necessarily have the degree that we say in our sales manual. And as a result of that, we would have an issue in any review because that document doesn't align with what you're doing out in community. And so we are doing the policy statement to correct some of that. And to Ken's point, there's going to be a date that proceeds today. Um, there's going to be in that clarifying statement. Any questions about that? Site visits announced and unannounced. As I said, we're going to continue, and they're not all going to be announced. Some will be announced, but we're going to be doing unannounced. Do you understand why we do unannounced? Anybody? I'm sorry? Every day. It shouldn't be a day that we can't walk in and see the right things happening in any program, right? I shouldn't have to call you for you to fix it. Now, I do tell people, call me at my house. Okay, you come in. Well, you need to call Sir Rachel. She lives by herself and she needs to fix some stuff before you walk in the door. That's why she got a whole, whole nother room. She put stuff in there. You can't do that in your child care setting, right? And so it has to be right every day, all day. With that said, we're going to come in and announce and unannounce. And I have been, and people who can raise their hand in here, I've come by and guess what? I didn't call first. I just walked up and said, hi. We're here and we're going to walk through your building. So just know, I may not have done it to yours yet, but I'm coming, all right? And I'm not gonna call you. I'm not gonna call you, and I'm not gonna call you. Everybody understand that? And that's across the board. I know there are 96 different entities that we fund and 213 sites, it's gonna take me some time to do it, but I'm not gonna call you. Because if I'm in the field and I have an extra hour, like we did before, we go, we got some time. We can now go over there, right? And we're going to do it. Any questions about unannounced? Any questions about announced? Any questions about site visits? Going once, going twice. So I had a signed, sealed, and delivered IGA. Yay! Nobody's excited? You should be. You know why? Because now you get a updated award. If you don't want it, I don't have to do the work. Oh, I'm serious. It's a lot of work for us to do this. Where's Angel? Angel, are you in agreement that if they don't want it, we don't have to do this? Anybody not want your 5% increase? Anybody? Nobody's hand went up for the 5 Not They don't want the 5%, so I, I'm assuming that you want your 5%, right? Okay, so you want your 5% increase. There's a few of you who, who I've said yes to who are going to get some slot adjustments at the same time, okay? Slot adjustments, meaning some people are going to get some increases. I'm still going to be talking to some other people. The first iteration may not have it because I don't want to stall getting this out because you need your 5%. But some others will be talking to later, but some other people are about to get both their 5% and some additional slots because they've been able to show us that they have the staff and everything else. Again, this is about the expansion required by who? Governor Pritzker in what? Smart Start. And I have to make sure that the Smart Start can actually happen which means that you can operate immediately <laughs> because I'm not gonna give you extra if we're talking about two years from now. That's not gonna work. It's gotta be something that can be done right away on the ECBG side, okay? And so those are gonna come out as soon as we can spend some time together, Angel and I making sure that we can get this EA, their executive approval through the system um, so that we can get that out to you, all right? And so it is finally in our hands and we can activate contracts for you right now. Isn't it better that it's now than April of next year? That's why I thought you guys were going to be excited because last year you didn't get it till when? At the end of the fiscal year. So we got it when? Come on, be happy. I don't have a lot to be happy about, people. Come on. <laughs> a signed, sealed, and delivered one. Come on, that makes a big difference. It says happy holidays. How, how many of you planning to cook on Thanksgiving? Raise your hands. Take note. How many? Because I need to eat. <laughs> You got them? Okay. So I just we just need your addresses so Sarathel can drop by and, and have dinner. Don't you want me to have dinner on Thanksgiving? Because yeah. I'm not cooking for anybody. And I have five grandsons who keep saying, no, that's not true. Let that not be true. So I did agree to one thing and one thing only. And the only reason I agreed to this is because my seven-year-old grandson laying in my lap, we were at a theater watching a play and he wouldn't sit still. I put him in my lap. And he looked up at me and he said, Nana, are you going to make us those pumpkin pies? I looked down at that child and said, your Nana don't make no pumpkin pies. She makes sweet potato pies. 
lady next to me said, I hear you, but I'm stuck with making what? So I will make sweet potato pies, but there won't be a turkey in my house. So I need to visit somebody. I might bring you a slice of pie. Any gift, any takers? Anyway, but what I want is this. We're at the holiday season. Things get really hairy around holiday seasons. You get staff off, you get time off, all these things happen, right? Your classroom still have to operate what? In compliance. Please monitor that and keep your staff who are tracking your staff attendance, vacations, and all of that. Keep your eye on that because I don't know when these folks are coming. They can still come somewhere around the holidays because they're predicting good weather in Chicago. Feds usually don't come when they think it's going to snow, but that's not what's predicted out there. So they're in Chicago right now. So they could knock on your door. So make sure that you know when people are in and when people are out and that you have coverage. How many of you have admin staff or above who have degrees and credentials? Then all of those people should be in classrooms when you are covering classrooms versus one person, right? Should a group of children be in a classroom with one adult? Why not? It's an accident waiting to happen. Should teachers walk out of classrooms and say, I'll be back, girl? Happened while I was in a building. I'm just saying, work with your staff, work with your procedure, work with your policy, work with your system. Make sure people understand the moment one person walks out, you're in what? non-compliance and that person standing there is only going to make note of it right and then if they see it again they're going to make note of it they see it again they're going to make no note of it and then it becomes a what a deficiency so make sure people who work for you understand if they are legal they're part of the staffing master which means if i need you i need you to cover that classroom if she needs to go to the bathroom which, it, by the way, it happens where teachers literally have to do that. I know y'all don't know that, but it happens, right? What's the plan? If there's two of us, how do I leave that classroom and leave it secure? What do I do? Anybody? Call somebody. How do they call somebody? Anybody? You have walkie-talkies. Do your staff use them? Oh, good. Thank you. Because I can hear walkie-talkies, but ain't nobody talking. But people are walking. See what I'm saying? That's a problem. It's a problem. And if I've observed it, it's a problem, which means even I came unannounced. I'm saying that I did, but I shouldn't see that ever and neither should you. So work with your staff to make sure compliance every hour of every day. Should a teacher be in a classroom with eight children under the age of three at lunchtime? No, make sure it's not happening. Make sure that you have coverage across the day, all day. One person leaves, who goes in? How are you covering your classrooms? I need you to think about all of those things, right? If you're closing for any time over the next month between now and Christmas and after, my staff need to receive your plan. Why? Because if the feds are coming and it's announced, they will ask me, do I have any dates that are going to be black out beyond what I've already presented to them? And I can say the majority of classrooms are closed due to holidays. So I need you to send to your lead your holiday plan closures, if any, so that we know and can anticipate that your program won't be in operation over, for example, the week between Christmas and New Year. I just need to verify that. I need it updated. I need it in our system right now so that we know what we're working with. Any questions about that? Yes. Send it again. I'm trying to make a calendar right now because I'm expecting some phone calls. So just send it again so I can make sure that we are all on target. Okay? Yes. Everybody. Everybody. Okay? And I'm going to say this to you. Because they see us as City of Chicago, because they know about our 213 sites, if there's a mistake and they show up at a door, then I can say that was PI. I can say that was PFA. But if it's closed and it's head start and I didn't know it, it's a huge issue, right? But I need to know you're closed so I can say, oh no. And so that's just gonna help us with our plan to make sure that we can keep things on task and on target. All right, any questions about that? So how many of you are planning to have a great 
Thanksgiving holiday season. I am because I'm going to take the week off next week, so I'm not going to be available next week. But see, when you do that, people think that you're doing that because you're happy I'm gone, Jocelyn. <laughs> what they're happy about. Remember, I talked to you guys about a vacation before. I get one day out of that. It didn't work. But this one, I'm going to make it work. Okay, I'm going to be gone Monday through Wednesday. Thanksgiving is Turkey Day. I'm not cooking for anybody, and I'm not coming back until that following Monday. So I am gone. I'm unavailable, and I'm inaccessible unless there's an emergency. I have to add that. Um, but my team will be available to you both. Um, Angel jo A Angel jo Dotson Jones or Dots Jones Dotson sitting in the back. She's the new manager of program admin will be available to you. Sh Sheree um, will also be there. Jocelyn will be there a part of the time. But my, no, you're out too. That's right. You, you're going somewhere more fun than I am. They like telling me where they're going, by the way. <laughs> all the places I don't get to go. I, I live vicariously through all these other people. Um, but she's going to be gone, and I know sometimes you will contact me through her. What I'm saying is please contact either a Angel Jones Dotson or Sheree Johnson. You're going to get it in my email that will give a bounce back to these other people you need to reach out and talk to. Um, but I will be gone. But I'm asking you, if you're operating, please operate in compliance. I cannot guarantee you that the feds who are in Chicago today I'm going to visit you that week, next week. I can't guarantee that. I might get a call to my work phone because I'll have it with me going, oh, by the way, Saretha, we're at, and once I get that, then I may turn around, but they're probably already going to be in your house at that point. All right? I can't guarantee you that it won't happen. But I want everyone to have a hot, happy holiday season. We will have a December meeting. Hopefully, we'll have a lot more fun in December. But what we're looking for is for everyone to stay safe, be healthy, feed Serefo. I keep saying that. Nobody can, nobody's offering me time to come to their house. I don't understand. I'm just trying to get away from my daughter and five grandsons who think they might get dinner at mine and it's not happening. Not this year. Um, so, but I want everybody to stay safe. I do know how hard it's been out here and I'm hoping you're gonna take some time for yourselves to do this because I know it takes 100% of you every day. And sometimes you got to at least give yourself something back so you can give it to your staff, but more so to yourself and to your families. And with that, is this your maid make it back in the room yet? So I'm going to move what, let's see, the next one. Angel, can you come on up, please? Thank you. She's still on with her? Okay, I'm going to go back in that room. So now I'm going to take updates. Hello, team. I'm here to bother you about real updates, things that you should be looking out for in 2024, like these data clinics that are going to happen more frequently um, at a standardized time every month. Stand behind. You hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just here to update you basically about things that are happening. Um, most of it starting in 2024, January. Um, and I'm excited, and I know you're excited about these data clinics that are going to happen at a standardized time, at a standardized day, every month, starting in January, where you can come, learn. And for some agencies, I've been told that we just need to pop up and teach. So that's going to happen with the data clinics. Um, I'm sure Mr. Ratho or Joss Johnson are going to talk to you about how attendance um, is going to be tracked now by the students. Something will come forth about that in the near future. Oh, she was talking about these 5%. Yes, Fisk was looking for you. So when they call you or whomever, because they have your contact number, Please give them whatever they need so they can get your budget done so we can get this to contract so you can start spending that money. Because Fred wants you to spend that money. I'm sure that's what he's going to say when he comes up. But I just thought I'd put that out there for him now. Um, just know that um, the CPPC council meeting, they're going to be doing voting. So I figured that if you could hype it out at your agency, as my data team hypes it up with the phone calls that they send out every month and the emails that they send out every month, um, we could just probably have a hype council meeting. 
this next meeting and people will be uber excited to vote. Anybody have any, does anybody have any questions for me? Or questions about what I just said? Or questions about what they see and they're reading? All right then, have fun. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Angel, for that intro, because I definitely want everyone to spend this money here. Um, we'll start off with the federal grants. The Head Start, we had 62%. Early Head Start, 52%. Uh, early Head Start CCP, we had 50%. And Early Head Start Expansion, we have 54%. We should be around 92%. We should be around 92%, guys, on this. Uh, with the state grants, uh, ECBG, we had 10%, and CCAP, we had 11%, and we should be around 33 and a third percent spent on these grants. As far as other uh, updates, um, FY23 federal, the COLA budgets are being reviewed and processed. You will be notified upon budget approval and can move forward with those invoices at that time. Final invoice submissions are due no later than January 24th of 2024. Please don't delay any further invoice submissions until you are notified of your COLA budget revision approval. As it relates to FY24 federal grants, the funder is reviewing and providing feedback for the grant application upon funder feedback. Please be sure to respond to requests within the time uh, frame requested. FY24 child care invoices should be submitted through October 31st of this year. Uh, FY24 PIPFA invoices should be submitted through October 31st. Uh, currently PFA invoices for services prior to 9-1 cannot be submitted. More information will be forthcoming about that. Oh, that was quick. Uh, Ken McGee, the floor is yours. If you have any questions, just email us as usual. We'll respond. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Mom. Try to get this. Yeah, I'm just get my HDMI in here. Oh, okay. It's not one there. Oh crap. Okay. Um. Should be. Hold on. Yeah, it's only one can be taken out from. Hold on. Can you show up? There it is. There it is. Okay. Great. Just in the mic. It's not the okay. record your screen. All right, cool. That'll work. Um, Turn this mic up for a second. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Ken McGee. Thank you for good morning. Yeah, I'm with Claridime, and I'm here to talk about the health and safety module and the fiscal community of practice. So wanted to just go through and give you a brief update about what's gone on so far, and also to take a couple of questions if folks have questions as well, okay? So good news, we have a total of 365 users signed up for the module, which was a great accomplishment. We've been out for about roughly about a week and a half, and we have 365 users, which was good. And I appreciate everybody whose staff did sign up for the module. As Sir Rathel said earlier, 
We're getting ready to open it up as well for folks who are funded for PFA and PI. Right now, it was just the federal agency. So that is a plus. Of that, even better news, 147 people have actually completed the actual module. And when I say completed, I mean 100% completed with certificates printed. That's happened. So kudos to you for doing that um, and getting your staffs in as well, too. There's still more federal staff that need to sign up. And we're gonna talk about a couple of reminders in a second as well. Um, and to give you an idea just about how it's looking for folks. So when we look at things, we're seeing that 56% of the folks who actually took the knowledge test actually finished the first time. They went through one time and they passed with a score of 80% or better. Then after that, we had folks 36%, two to three attempts as far as taking where they might not have got 80% the first time, then they took it again or took it again, and then they went ahead and were able to pass. The last group, about four or more attempts, meaning that they took the final knowledge check, and this is the only data point that we're looking at right now. They actually, it took them a little bit longer to do it, but they were able to do it. So that's out of the 147 of 146 that I just talked about. So, I say that to you to tell you for your staff who have not taken the module yet, it is doable to pass. You may very well pass the first time. I don't know for sure, but that does not mean that you don't keep trying. So continue to try. And then for agencies, program directors, executive directors who may be in the room, check in with your staff. Have they finished? Have they passed? So check in with them to see how they're doing, okay? What are people saying about the training? Going to leave a, show you a couple of quotes up here as far as some of the quotes from users who, as far as the ending survey, as far as what they're saying. And most of them are saying that, yeah, they feel like I've had more knowledge on health and safety training. I learned a lot. Folks are learning. It's providing an opportunity for you to get some common understanding with everybody looking at the same thing in a period of time. So I think that's important for you to be able to have that type of dialogue with your staff once they take the module. Okay, what'd you think? What didn't make sense? How does that not align with what we're doing? So keeping those things in mind. Some other folks also talked about just what they were thinking about what they learned, right? One of the big things that Sarethel talked about is being able to report an incident and knowing the proper procedure about what you need to do at this time. So, those are some of the big takeaways. And anybody who was in the module, you most likely saw that incident reporting and mandated reporting were two of the bigger sections in the module. We really put a lot of focus in that content because we wanted to make sure the folks had an understanding about what was required for them as far as you being staff, delegate agency staff, or folks who don't have regular contact with children as well. So you want to just think about what did your staff, you know, it's going to be great to say, you know what, sign up for the training. Yeah, everybody sign up for the training. But for you as program directors and leaders of your organization, afterwards ask folks, what did you think about it, right? That, that's more the part because the thinking starts right action, right? Whatever right action to keep children healthier and safe and safer, really, you want to make sure that that's the thought process that's going on with your staff as far as that they're keeping it top of mind. A couple of reminders, and this is actually old, even as of this morning. It's not just for federally funded agencies anymore. As Sarathel said, we've got ECBG and federally funded agencies. So sign up, right? And signing up is not enough. That's the other part, too. We got some folks in who signed up. Great. We see their names. We see their agencies. But that's not the complete process. We actually want people to take the module. You're going to take it at your own pace, but we want you to finish to be able to get your certificate to say that you've been, that it has been completed. So signing up is great, great start, but that is not enough. Next one that we're seeing just sort of administratively a little bit is one user per agency. Sometimes we're getting folks who are signing up with their delegate agency email address, signing up with the Gmail, their Hotmail, maybe their Yahoo. We just want one because we want to be able to track you back to your agency because part of what's going to happen with compliance is just seeing how many folks from your agency actually did finish. So it's a lot easier if you've got an agency URL that say your ADS McKinley and everybody who's ADS McKinley signs up with that, that's fine. And it helps out a lot versus having somebody who's 
tw Tweety Bird 22 at Yahoo, right? That That's a little bit harder sometimes. But we also realize that that's going to happen with folks who have partners or home-based programs because they might not necessarily be attached to your URL. And that's fine. And we can go in and take it and filter through that. But what we do want to avoid is seeing duplicates of the same name three or four times, right? That's what we want to avoid more than anything else. Encouragement is to use your agency. If you have an agency URL, use that first. But if you don't, we get it. Question right here. Yeah. So to that, I can tell you what's been going on because I've been monitoring registration signups. Everybody has been who signed up has been actually enrolled within 24 hours, where usually enrollments are happening twice a day, usually around noon or one o'clock and the other time is about 530. So they should have gotten an email that said within two days and that's looking more toward the holidays. But right now, shouldn't be anybody who signed up from your agency who's waited more than 24 hours. Yeah. So if there is somebody, let me know. Okay. De definitely. Other thing is, is that your access to the module is actually going to be, you're going to have access to the module for the next basic year, right? So even though you've gone through, taken the module, completed it, you can still, your staff, you and your staff can still go back and review as needed when you need to. The only caveat is, is do not mark things as incomplete now that was marked as complete. You don't want to do that because then it looks like you didn't complete the module. But as far as you wanting to go back and review, you can go back, review early and often as much as you want to, and then you'll have access to it. Okay. And you also, in the event, what we've also seen a couple of times is folks have emailed us saying that, yeah, I, I don't know what my password is. You can reset your password on your own. There, if you click at the bottom of the screen, I need to reset my password. As long as you're using your agency email address, you will see an email like this that will say that you can reset your password. You can do that independently without having to reach out to anyone to do that, as long as you're using your agency email address, right? Your e the email address that you initially signed up for. Let me change that. The one that you initially signed up for. So that is, but you can, and your staff can change their passwords, right? Okay, next one is to remember to download and print your certificate once you complete. Download and print your certificate. Your certificate is going to be unique to you at, as your particular agency and that particular user. And if you provided your Gateways Registry ID number, that also will be on that certificate as well. And it's going to generate a unique certificate just for you. That's a PDF that you can print out, save to your computer, and also based on your policies, most likely getting into your HR department too. Okay. This is an example of what that's going to look like, right? So you'll have your agency, your registry, your gateway registry member ID number, and it's going to say an expired date. It's going to give a unique number as well. So that is what should be able to be printed out and check with your staff because there's a couple of folks who we saw that their percentage of completion is around 94%, which means that they did pretty much everything, but they didn't cross the finish line of actually doing the last little piece. So check with them on that as well. Um, some of the big takeaways when we think about the health and safety module, one of the things is, is just have conversations about health and safety. So once your staff takes the module, it's a great opportunity for you to be able to have some conversations about health and safety, right? And then also it creates common points of understanding about health and safety, about what does DFSS want us to do as far as incident reporting? They want us to report everybody in your staff, if they took the module and passed, it should be able to raise their hand and say same day, because you guys have a common point of understanding. Use this tool to help you start to develop common points of understanding so you take you can take some of the guesswork out because it doesn't matter if you're a multi-site agency. If everybody at the different sites took it and passed it, then you know at least at one point you're grounded at this with the same information points, right? And, and that's important if you're gonna because you're gonna have expectations as program directors, executive directors about 
My staff should know this. Our staff should do, know this. FSS has the same type of expectations that, yes, you should know this. You should know about health and safety. You should know about incident reporting. But this is a way for you to sort of start to confirm that folks actually know as well. So use the tool for what it was designed for to help to reinforce things. It doesn't take the place of the other mandated reporting and other trainings that you have to do, but this should be a reinforcement piece for you. So please use it to your best of your ability for that. I would encourage you to do that. And folks have access to it. I've seen folks have taken it at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. Folks have taken it on the weekend. So you got access to it as web-based and it's not unique to saying that you got to be at your center to do it. It's just a web-based tool. So please use it. Um, and if anybody is thinking about signing up, if it's federal agencies right now, we'll need to get the agencies logged, agencies listed in who are PFA and PI into the drop down list. But for my federal folks, if anybody doesn't have a way to log, you can use the QR code right now if you want to to go to the go there to actually sign up if you haven't done it. So by all means, do that. And I'll hold for a second if folks need to take a look at it, but it should open up for you just fine. Okay. I don't see any more phones up, so I want to sort of, I got one more back there. Well, and and just a small reminder for a couple of agencies, some folks, I think that they've really looked at it as far as in the CSD updates that this is something strictly for my program director. It's not just for your program director. This is something for your staff. So some instances I've seen a program director, and that's the only person for the agency. Other agencies have 40 users in it, right? 40, 45 users. One agency actually has 50 users and 45 of them have actually passed. So... It can be done, but you got to put forth the effort to do it. Any questions about health and safety before I move to my next topic? Any questions? I know I've got one we got to follow up on as far as users signing up, but anybody else? Okay. Thank you all for everybody who has participated in this, and it's, it's been a good thing, and we just continue to help people to hope folks will continue to learn. Now I want to switch gears for a quick second. Oh, and one last thing before that, though. In the event that you have questions, folks have questions about the health and safety module, this is our unique email address for the health and safety module. It's not for anything else, but that is it. So pdmhealth.safetymod at claridime.com. That is the email address for you to send your questions. If there's questions, by all means, do that. Um, yeah. PI will start to be available. Give us about two days. We're going to get that drop down list of where your PI agencies are going to show up there too. Yeah, about two days. Yep. So by the next time you see the next CSD update, it's going to say that they're logged in there for sure. But I'll tell you, we'll work to have them in there by Monday. Okay. Huh? Huh. Um, okay. Next thing. Fiscal community of practice. This might sound like it's a little bit narrower for folks, but about three or four weeks ago, we established a fiscal community of practice for our delegate agencies, for our early childhood education delegate agencies. And the fiscal community of practice is really, it's a drop-in session called Fiscal Fridays, pretty much, where your fiscal folks or program directors, et cetera, you can drop in and talk about either your fiscal questions have discussion points, and we've had discussions, et cetera, about just fiscal things going on, everything from how are we going to spend new money, right? What's happening with COLA? The topics are pretty much open, and the concept is, is that it's not a regular training. It's not a training that's being recorded. We encourage people to have their conversations about what they're trying to look at and what they need to know more about. Some of the great pieces about it is that we have not only Claridime staff and delegate agency folks on these sessions, but we also have folks from DFSS Finance on those calls in those sessions as well, as well as we've had folks from CSD on those calls as well. So it's sort of all the sort of the key stakeholders 
sitting down and having discussions. And with that, you know, it starts with, you're gonna be able to present your ideas and it's, it's your discussion, right? So it's a drop in. It's not mandatory, but it's a benefit. And I think it gives folks an in, insight on what's coming down the pipe, right? I can tell you now that about two or three weeks ago, we were talking about the pending ECBG change that was going to happen as far as with PFA and PI, about what was coming on the board. Those who were sitting in that meeting had the ability to start to plan a little bit around that from hearing that information. But that happened because they were there. So I encourage you, if you're a program director and you can't get there, have your fiscal people drop in. It helps. Getting more information is not going to hurt you. I see one of my people back there who's an active participant. I won't call her name, but she's brought up some good points for us to think about. And thank you for that, okay? And she shakes her head. Yes, thank you. So, but this is the way we start to make collective progress as far as everybody starting to have more of a common understanding about what the challenges and the strengths about what people are facing, right? Because sometimes if it's just a unilateral conversations, everybody doesn't know what the other side is thinking about. So you want to be able to have conversations where people are just talking. It's not compliance-based. It's not a matter of we're trying to give necessarily TA. And then the other part, too, that's down here at the bottom is that folks are actually getting a chance to learn from their peers as well about agencies who say, well, this is how we do it. And somebody else is saying, no, this is how we do it. And somebody else sometimes is like, I don't know what to do. And folks are trying to help each other. And Head Start should be about, and early childhood should be about support. If you're going to support your families, I think it's important for you to be able to support yourselves too. So use this for the best tool possible while it's available to you, right? And the next meeting is at one o'clock tomorrow. And if you want to sign up, this is a QR code to the Zoom link as well. So please, if you take it and you need to forward it to your fiscal person, say, hey, maybe you need to get on here. Do that, you know. But definitely um, get involved. We want to get your voices. And we think we get better things that we're able to do when you actually are involved. You know, not just from a push, but sometimes we need to do push in both ways. So that's my take and spiel on that. So please register. And any questions about that? About this at all? Okay. Oh, I'll go back. I see a camera still up. Good. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I appreciate your time this morning and have a great holiday. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's so weak. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheree Johnson. I am the manager of program operations and quality with Children's Services. Um, I am also, though I am in Children's Services, I am the liaison for our division uh, regarding new arrivals. So, since we know new arrivals are present here in Chicago, um, I wanted to ensure that we keep this particular slide um, on every EDPD meeting. We talked about this last EDPD where we just wanna ensure that you guys are um, in the know regarding supports that can be provided. A lot of folks you know, wanna know how do I donate items to families? How do I donate items to shelter? Um, and these are your being used to do so. If you want additional information, there's a link there at the bottom of the screen. Um, where we have New Life Centers. Again, they are providing assistance with permanent housing. We have Chicago Furniture Bank, which provides not just a room of furniture, but multiple rooms of furniture for folks, not just for new arrivals, but for homeless uh, or folks who may not be homeless and just need supports with finding um, furniture for their homes. Um, we have Cradles to Crayons that accepts donations as well as give out donations to various individuals throughout the city. Um, in Instituto del Progreso Latino, um, they have Amazon wish lists that are available if folks want to, you know, donate specific things. Um, those wish lists are posted online where 
you can literally click on things that people are specifically requesting in shelter settings um, if you would like to support the cause. So again, there's the slide for that and additional information um, can be found through that link. Are there any questions about this particular slide? All right, so I wanted to ensure that you guys were clear or aware on where we are with um, early learners that are in, or potential early learners that are in shelter settings. Um, so what you're seeing on your screen um, are 15 family shelters that DFSS facilitates. Um, the addresses are not listed there, um, and that's intentional, and I'm going to explain why. This is public information. Yes, absolutely. If you would like to just Google the name of the shelter, you're welcome to do so. I can't prohibit you from doing so. But the reason why I left the addresses off is because what we don't want, well, what we I'll just say it. What we do not want is folks just showing up to shelter. We don't want you spinning your wheels just showing up because the shelter staff will not let you in. Um, and it's beyond, we know your intent is to support, your intent is to be of service. However, there are other entities who are not doing that. I mean, it may be for personal gain, it could be media, it could be, but in essence, it's just to protect all parties that are in, currently in shelter settings. Um, we have some folks who are in shelter who may be running from domestic situations um, or other situations. So just to ensure safety of all parties in shelter settings, um, intentionally, we are encouraging any of our parties, and that's anyone affiliated with DFSS, anyone affiliated with Children's Services, that if you would like to support the cause in, in reference to supporting those families, I am your direct contact to do so. Um, if you, and I'm gonna talk about the specifics of these numbers, I see a hand in the back. Give me one quick second, one quick second. Um, but what this slide is showing you is as of last week, um, this is our census data according to age group. Um, so for each of those shelters, and I've bolded those shelters in particular who have the highest census, meaning they have the highest amount of children um, in these shelter settings. Um, and this is where our targets are in terms of the bolded um, shelters there. So it's AIC, which is an uptown, Halstead, Lower West Side, End of Chicago, which is near North, Lakeshore Hotel, which is in the Kenwood area, MWRD, which is in North Park, Northwestern, which is not affiliated with the hospital. So it's North Space Western, not Northwestern, okay? So there's a shelter that's on Western, on North on Western, which is Northwestern. Am I clear? I hope I'm not confusion. <laughs> it's not Northwestern Hospital. It's a shelter on Western, on Northwestern called North Space Western. That's the newest shelter and they're kind of small there. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that that's the newest one that just popped up last week. Ogden, which is also large on the near West side and Walnut Shelter, which is also on the near West side. The largest shelter that we have in this list is in of Chicago and they're large. Not only are they large, but they are in a very peculiar area, meaning that they are on Ohio, downtown-ish area very limited early learning opportunities near there. Um, and if there are, are early learning opportunities near there, they're private pay and they don't really target homeless families, right? Um, so I just wanted to highlight each of the age groups, zero to two, three to five, um, the total amount of zero to five in each of those shelter settings, um, because this is where, if we go to the next slide, um, your support is needed. Before I dive into this data, I know we had a question in the back. Yes, ma'am. Yes, the question is, can PI um, do actual home visits um, and enrollments at the shelters? Yes, in order to do so, any enrollment opportunity must come through myself and I have a, a colleague here at DFSS, his name is William B.J. Lohr. Many of you have you know, interacted with him or met him, uh, but you have to go through the both of us to do so, just so that we can do a soft intro of who you are, your organization, to the shelter staff. So yes. Yes, Amina. Her question was, are there any shelters on the south side? As of right now, nothing south. Um, but is that Kim? The Kim Will was on? I'm sorry. Lakeshore. I'm so sorry. So sorry. Thank you. If we, I'm confusing myself. So sorry. So we have uh, Lakeshore Hotel, which is in Kenwood. Yes. Let me take a look at this list one more time. 
And even if we don't see any, so there may be other questions like, are there any far south or anything like that? Um, currently, we are exploring additional shelter spaces. Um, we're uh, we're looking into additional spaces because so this list may very well have been updated as of today um, because we know that new arrivals continue to come into the city of Chicago and the team is consistently looking for additional shelter space. But as of right now, these are the now these are family shelters now. OK, there are 15 family shelters total. There are 25 shelters. So the other additional 10 shelters are adult or single individual shelters. So they are not on this list. For the sake of today's conversation, we're only speaking about family shelters, of course, because we are targeting those children age zero to five. Are there any other questions before I move on? Good questions. So we're presenting this information to you just so that one, you can be in the know in terms of what's happening um, in shelter based off of the, the information I just provided to you from zero to five, um, there are about uh, 700, well, 1,766 children in shelter. To date, we have enrolled over 700 of those children. And those children have been enrolled through collaborative efforts through CBOs such as yourselves. Um, we know some of you have also been doing recruitment efforts at independent uh, refugee agencies, police stations. Some of you have just been walking down the street. You see someone on the, on the corner with a sign and you've just walked up to them and we applaud your efforts. Um, we just also wanted to provide you with some concrete data that we've gathered thus far regarding uh, where we are um, with zero to five in shelter. So as of right now, there are approximately 1,057 children who are in shelter who have not you know, engaged in early learning, where I am charged, right? It says DFSS, the bottom bullet, DFSS is charged, but I'm charging everyone um, who has some type of access to providing early learning opportunities. I'm charging you guys to reach out to me if you have the capacity um, to enroll any additional children. Now, let me give the preface that I am well aware that we have many early learners here in the city of Chicago beyond shelter who are in need of early learning opportunity, okay? I am not halting any recruitment opportunities that you already have in play, I am not telling you not to continue to work with your neighborhoods to enroll and work with those families. Please continue to do so. This is an added layer of support um, that we are extending to all of our you know, collaborative partners to ensure that you are also included in the process of um, having the opportunity to enroll families in shelter, okay? Um, so, and we also know that many of you have been enrolling, you know, I can call a number of you by name who have already been in shelter, who have already, you know, worked with families who have actually enrolled, but we also know that some of those families have moved on. We cannot ball and chain anyone to stay in our programming. So we know that some of them, you know, you've done your due diligence, you enrolled them. You haven't seen them in days because they left, right? These are transient families and any family has the, you know, the opportunity to do so. So this is going to be an ongoing effort. We know that there are some agencies who may very well just have five vacancies right now. And if you wanna enroll those five families, I welcome you to reach out to me. Um, and so that we, oh, not five families, but five spots, I welcome you to reach out to me so that we could talk through it. End of Chicago, I mentioned is in a very peculiar area. However, home visiting is possible, right? So even though it's our largest shelter, you may not be able to have those families come directly to your center or your organization for service. Maybe you can bring the service to them. Maybe you can do a socialization around the corner at a library. Maybe you can do it at a park. I don't know, but that's something that we could talk through. And we know these numbers continue to rise. So this number or the numbers that I'm providing, 1,057 children, that was as of last week. We have conducted some enrollment since then. So that number may have gone down, but overall as of last that I've knew, it was a little bit over 1,000 children that still need early uh, learning supports. Yes, Amina. Any other buckets of funding that they're eligible for in terms of early learning support? Yes, they're eligible across all funding. All funding, so CCAP has measures in place to support homeless families, yes. Uh, PI, PFA has uh, supports in place to support homeless families, yes. We know federally, all federal programming has supports in, in place. All of them are deemed categorically eligible across the board, yes. 
And furthermore, when you are deemed categorically eligible, especially when you are homeless, you know, we should not be asking any homeless family, show me your birth certificate and your physical and your everything. Oh, you don't have it. Oh, we can't help you. We should not be doing that. And if anyone needs any support with that, please feel free to reach out to me because I know it's like, but but what do we do? How do we how do we do that? You know, all standards across the board, be it CCAP, PFA, PI, be it, you know, federally, all those standards say that we should be working with families to support them to get those documents. And we can continue with the enrollment while we work with those families to get those documents. I see your hand back there. You put it down, you kind of. How is that going to work with DCFS? With licensing. So we know that there are some gray areas when it comes to what a federal standard or what a state standard such as PFAPI may say in terms of leniency to support those families versus what your state licensure may say. Um, it's my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm whispering to Sarah. Uh, <laughs> my understanding is that when we've spoken to, when I've spoken to other licensing reps and licensing entities, and we made them aware that this is what the standard says, is that if we clearly label or, you know, document that this family is homeless, you are documenting your efforts in terms of, I'm working with this family to get A, B, C, D, that your licensing rep is in the know and supportive of that. So if they come and do a pop-up visit, say, show me all your, your child records or anything like that, you should be able to say, Sheree Johnson, she's homeless. I'm working with her. My staff is doing da-da-da-da-da. And your rep should be okay with that. You need to have a good grip and handle on who those families are, though. They shouldn't go in blindly like, why well, only see out of 26 kids, I only see 20 birth certificates. And you're like, uh, no. Six of those families are homeless. We're working with them. We know for sure this family's going through a domestic violence situation. This family had a fire. This family, you know, you should have a grip on what's happening with their caseloads so that you can tell the narrative and there should be no issue with that. I hope that answered your question. Yes. They should say they did, but okay. If we need to talk through that. You said, but, but, but. Help us understand what the but is. This isn't just about serving migrants or new arrivals. So let me let me remind all of you that licensing in the national level rests with HHS, right? Federal government. From federal government. Oh, I'm okay. Okay. Just because I was eating something earlier, but so licensing rests with HHS, federal government. It sifts down through states. Federal dollars, HHS. Federal rolls down to states. ECBG starts where? Federal government rolls down to states. It all rolls right back up to we have a same statute that has written all of this, no matter whose house this ends up in. In licensing, to what Sheree is saying, it's document, document, and document. If you are documenting what you're doing with that family, Okay, if you are saying that I got this parent who is homeless, right? And that parent is unable to just like you, if a mom walks in your door, she's in a domestic violence situation and he took everything. She still needs her children to be where so she can go get everything. She needs to be in care. You are authorized to serve those families, but what your responsibility now is, is to help them obtain those documents. There are phone calls, there are letters that can be crafted, there's work that can be done to help them get their documents so that they can then be in the system where you have a documented record. But you are granted that time to do that in McKinley, McKinney Vento and other laws that allow you to do what we're asking you to do. If you're running up against a licensing rep through, that is having a different conversation with you and saying something different, you gotta let me know um, so that I can go to those that I work with to say, this isn't just about a migrant. This is about serving homeless families in the city of Chicago. And you're going to have people all the time who's going to show up who doesn't have everything. What are we supposed to do? Same thing in COVID. Doctor's office is closed, right? Some of them never reopen. Parents are struggling to try to get medical and everything else. 
We've got to work with families so that families can get the services that they need. And the law allows for that. If you're, ru if you're running into some issues and you need some help, please don't hesitate, let us know. But I need the name of the licensing rep, not just my licensing rep. I'm just going to say that because it doesn't help me if I'm going to a supervisor because she's going to say who. And I have to say who in order to help you. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? But as you're bringing in families, know that they are all categorically eligible, as Sheree said, against all your funding sources, whether it's CCAP, PFAPI, and any funding source is federal. Categorical eligibility is categorical eligibility, right? So I'm going to take um, liberty for one second to also say some of the migrant families are being issued SNAP, which makes them what? Categorically eligible. They have a card that allows them to go get food for their babies. They're working with them at the shelter to, to do that. They're not working with them at the police station. They're not working with them in other places, but they are at the shelters to help them do this. So again, they have a piece of documentation that says to you what? They're eligible. And so let's just work together. These are the same things, and I'm not just saying this for those that are newcomers. These are the same rules and standards for children in the city of Chicago, period. Okay? She gonna ask me, do I want the mic back? Is my name Sheree? Do I like to talk? Absolutely, I want the mic back. Um, and so Sarethel brought up a good point too when it comes to police stations, uh, just letting you know um, how the process goes. Cause I know a lot of folks are like, why are there so many families at police stations and why are they not in shelter? So as buses arrive into the city of Chicago, typically what happens is that they go through a screening process. They're given a, a, an identifying number. And then through that identifying number, which is like a placement number, they are then placed in shelter. A number of our shelters are at capacity. So there, there's nowhere for the families to go. So some of those families are, I mean, they have the option. No one's bald and chain. Remember, if I want to just step out of line and go stand over here at the Jewel and do what I do over here at Jewel, you have every liberty to do, to do so, right? But then there are some folks who are being transported to police stations as a holding spot or holding space until uh, space is available in shelter, okay? So those police stations, just for a disclaimer, are not being monitored or they are not facilitated by Department of Family Support Services. DFSS does not orchestrate or facilitate anything that happens at a police station. We are only responsible for the 15 shelter locations that were on the previous slide, okay? So for those of you who are doing fantastic work at police stations, I applaud you. There are some, there's an organization, I'm not gonna name them, I'm not even gonna look their way, okay? Cause I just don't wanna do that. But there's an organization that is in this room. They have, you know, um, one of their site directors literally drives to a police station daily. They go read to children. They provide resources. They're gaining trust and they're doing excellent work. And it's quite possible that a lot of those families will feel trustworthy of that center and will enroll. But then they also might get a call from the city saying, you now have a spot at a shelter, but that shelter is up north, uptown. They may not participate in that programming anymore. And that's what's happening because now they have to relocate to get to that shelter. So again, this is a transient situation and we are encouraging you guys to keep doing the work that you're doing because it is helpful, but also be aware that if you reach 100% enrollment today, like, yes, I finally filled all my spots. It could very well change tomorrow, right? Yes. Oh, Katrina. She said, <laughs> she said, our mayor put out a new mandate saying 60 days. What does that mean? What uh, He put in a mandate for 60 days. Does that, does that apply to uh, these migrants? Does it apply to our new arrivals? Does that apply to shelter settings? And the answer is yes. Yes, there's a lot of things beyond Children's Services Division, okay? Because I'm just a messenger. There's a lot of things beyond Sarethel Burgess Burnett as our deputy. A lot of things beyond us that are happening regarding new arrivals that we don't have control over, but we're just a messenger, right? And so, yes, uh, that does apply to shelter that in essence, they are trying to rotate families in and out within 60 days. 
to afford room for new families to come in. We can provide them with the support and they can move on. Again, no one's bought and changed. So families may say, you know what, this is it. You know, my cousin in Cali called me, I'm gone and they may be gone. There are some families who, even though they're in shelter and they have, clearly they have early learners with them, they just don't want to, no. No, Sheree's daycare, I don't care how fantastic you are. I don't want it, no, I don't. So, you know, we have to be uh, mindful and understand that even though we're putting our best effort forward, families are not gonna stay and families are not gonna enroll, but we encourage you to still, you know, keep trying. Yes. So her, she said a lot, I'm going to summarize, okay? It's okay, I got you. So in essence, she said that uh, through her work in shelter and engaging with many individuals who are in shelter, she's encountered a lot of folks who have potential to be potential employees of you know the center. They may have credentials of some type. Um, they have the good go-getter go spirit and all of that. There may have been language barriers, but those have been overcome. Has there been dialogue regarding just, supporting new arrivals with employment opportunities. Did I do a good job here? With early learning. And the, the answer is yes, there have been dialogue um, because keep in mind when folks arrive in shelter, we're not just talking about early learning opportunities. We're also talking about housing. We're also talking about medical intervention. We're also talking about legal help. And they're also talking about work authorization. Um, so there is a lot of talk and work around supporting individuals in shelter with um, work authorization so that they can get a job because we know that in order to be sufficient, um, we need uh, a steady income. And so they are also working with them to, in addition to gaining housing, how do you maintain that housing? How do you maintain just self-sufficiency? And that is through work authorization. So yes, that conversation is being had. What does that look like in to regards to your programming? I'm not sure yet. Um, but we do know that that is one of the top priorities is to support families, you know, looking at their credentials. Where are they? A lot of them, they're not just, you know, broken destitute, right? Some of them are coming over with degrees. We know that degrees exist elsewhere. They are educated. They are here for whatever reason, be it, you know, whatever the reason is they're here, but they are, you know, beyond lacking education, right? So um, those are some of the things and some of the conversations that are being had in shelter to better support them. It's just, it's not just, oh, you're a new arrival. Let me get you a house. Let's talk through what do you need? Um, where are your barriers, that type of thing. So that's what those case managers are doing um, is a full holistic support menu for those families. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So I don't, so she had a question about, uh, do we have information on those individuals who are receiving authorization? We do not have that information. Um, I can't answer if other entities within DFSS is tracking that information. Um, but what I would say is that um, as a parent or a guardian who is enrolled in your program, um, you are at liberty to have those conversations with them. So you could talk to them about their eligibility. Um, to my understanding, and we can have additional conversation offline, uh, when it comes to CCAP, um, they are given that initial three months. But if we receive that, there's a homeless questionnaire um, that if they receive authorization of this homeless questionnaire, it can be extended beyond three months. They would get 12 months of eligibility. So perhaps, and someone make a note for me, uh, DFSS team, uh, we're going to send out some additional supports regarding CCAP on what CCAP eligibility looks like for homelessness, that initially you do get three months, but there are some stipulations in place where that three months can be extended for the full 12 months. But I say all that to say, 
that if a parent has work authorization and you'd like to know if they are still eligible beyond what you know them to be eligible for, have that conversation with them. But if you have any specific questions related to this, you are welcome to reach out to me, okay? But we'll circulate some information to support um, homelessness and CCAP across the board. Very good question. Yes. Hi, Kiki. Hi. What's up? Bless you. Do I know how long it takes to get a work permit? I do not. Yay. You're welcome. I didn't say that. I think it was BJ who may have said that. So she said a lot, but what she said was, is there any supports in place to help um, new arrival families get transportation from shelter to a lot of your agencies? As of right now, um, we, there is no direct transportation line for this. However, the conversations are being had regarding how do we provide transportation supports? How do we provide language barrier supports? Because some programs have space, but they do not have the capacity in-house to translate. Um, so we're, there are dialogues happening um, regarding linguistic supports is what it was literally labeled as. Um, so at surface level, we do not have that readily available, um, but there are some agencies who have been providing bus cards um, there are some agencies uh, on their own have been providing, you know, um, transportation, but we don't do that. So, but we do know that once we get clarity on transportation um, and if there are translation services available, we will share that. So again, I do have a job <laughs> here at Children's Services beyond new arrivals, but I'm, my goal with this and having it on the agenda every EDPD is so that we can keep the dialogue going how are you keep the dialogue going um, to ensure that when things come about that you are in the know so today it's I don't have much information but next month I may or even sooner because I talk to you um as soon as we have more information ready I'll be sure to share it you're welcome that was all that I had are there any other thank you Mara and any other questions about new arrivals or work here so what is the new, uh, the next thing to do for you if you are not currently in a shelter setting and you would like more information on, well, what's near me or how can I help? And I have, you know, 11 spots right now in, in PFA and I have 37 spots in my home visiting and I have, I'm looking at various people around the room because that's, those are real numbers. And I have, you know, 12 in this classroom and 12 in this two-year-old classroom and how can I help? Because I have space. You're going to reach out to me to initiate that enrollment opportunity. Sheree Johnson, sheree.johnson at cityofchicago.org is my email. You are welcome to email me. If I don't reach out right away, I'm trying my darndest. I'm right here right now. And since I've been here, I have a hundred emails in my inbox and that's okay, that's my job. I'm gonna do my best to reach out to all of you, but you are welcome to reach out to me so that we can do uh, what we need to do to get you on site for shelter recruitment, okay? Thank you all for all that you do. If there are no other questions, I'm done. Are we done with, with today? We, we, we finished? I think we're done. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So that is a very specific and nuanced situation that we can talk more about offline because there may not be a definitive answer for that. Um, and we may need to collaborate with the entity 
that you're going through to fund that particular spot. So if this child care assistance program, we can get clarity from the child care assistance program on what they'd like to see in terms of documentation, because that might be tricky. And the person sitting right in front of you <laughs> can provide additional insight as well. That's Margaret Jordan. She um, has CCAP expertise, of course. Okay. So when it comes to nuanced situations, we know that there are going to be some um, very gray areas. We have to really talk through those on a specific basis. It won't go across the board for every case. So that's why we're taking that one offline. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Was that the last slide? All right. So a couple of things as we're closing out today. How many of you are in the CARES system? Raise your hands. How many of you, thank you, put your hands down. How many of you are not in the CARES system? One. Let's, let's talk to you before you leave. Let me say this to everyone. We are moving away from COPA period. And in order for us to move completely away from COPA period, we've got to get to CARES period. And so everybody needs to be working in it. And because everybody is not working in the system 100%, it's really, really difficult for my team in reporting. So how many of you are or have access to the spreadsheets, for example, for ISB reporting? Would you like to move out of those? We all would, but I can't until I can get reporting 100% out of CARES. When I can go in and pull reports out of the system, you will no longer have to do that. We're not there yet. For example, remember I mentioned earlier today for federal that we are on an under-enrollment mandate. We're under-enrolled. We are going to be monitored monthly, but the monitoring that they're going to be doing is not just how many children you have enrolled. And I know that's some of the questions that my staff are asking. How many children do you have enrolled at your site? 52, okay, great, we put down 52. No longer good enough. I need to know how many children and how many classrooms and I need it by child. So I know you wanna move away from um, spreadsheets now, right? So we need that kind of detailed information on every one of your children. And so we were collectively having a meeting trying to figure out the best way to get this from you, but there's no way around getting it from you. We've got to have the information on a monthly basis so that we can report it to authors of Head Start. For PFA, for example, they're asking for attendance for PFA. We got to be able to get the detail that we need in order for us to be able to do our work, which is why you're still in spreadsheets. I want to get you out of the spreadsheets. I want to get my staff out of having hundreds of spreadsheets that they're trying to analyze and aggregate. It is a huge undertaking for us to be able to do this. But in order to do so, everybody has to be actively in there, all your classrooms set up all your children enrolled, all your classrooms are in and up and every day somebody's going in and doing what you were doing in the other system was is going in and capturing attendance and meal counts. You can do that. All of what I've just said in CARES. And if I could get all of that done every day, we could get off these spreadsheets. So are we in agreement that we want to get away from spreadsheets? Okay. I need 100%. Once I have 100%, then I can do that. What I can't do is move away from them and then find that, oops, we forgot somebody. So I've got to do one or the other. And I really want to get away from the one that we're doing and move over to the other, but I need 100% participation in order for us to do that. I know Craig has been doing data clinics and we're going to do everything we can to help and support, but we've got to get it done. The last thing is we are moving forward with the CCAP module the HR module and the PD portal, which are three other very important pieces of CARES, which we are just finishing and getting them into UAT or testing so that we can move them from that to development so that we can launch those as well. And we're trying to get everything done by the end of this year and then training. Everybody understand there was a thing that we were using before and it was called what? COPA. It is no longer our system of record. It is not our system going forward. It will only archive what you had in there. That's all COPA is going to do for us. You're not going to be able to go in and do CCAP. And I know those of you who have CCAP been doing your billing over there, you're going to be moving and doing that in CARES as well. Everything's going to be in that system. And if you're not in that system, you're not going to be funded consistently because we won't have the data we need to continue to do that. So how many of you need more training? See all the hands up in the room, people? Okay. 
So what I'm going to ask you to do is, and I'm going to ask you to, I would say me, but I'm not going to be there next week. So don't send it to me. Um, I'm going to ask you to send it to Angel Jones Dotson in the back. What you feel you need for training. Okay. So we can figure out how we can help you move this forward because we've got to get from one to the other and we got to do it like now, people. We are saying that we want this system to be finished in December. And then January through March, we're going to do the remaining of the testing of whatever we have to do to see if there are any additional glitches. And then we want to do what's called end-to-end -end training, where we will have an opportunity to take you from the beginning of that system all the way through on all the different modules and how it works. But in order to make that make sense for you, you got to be in the system. You got to be using it. Your staff who need to be in it need to be in it so that all of that's going to make sense. So we've got to move the needle on this. We've been doing this now, believe it or not, two years. We're done with it saying, will you get in? It's either you're in or you're out, but you have to be in that system. That's what we're going to be using to get your reports. We're going to get out of these spreadsheets and we're going to live in a data system. All right. And this is November 16th, I think. We got to be able to do that before you go home for Christmas. So please, if you or your staff need additional support, see Angel Jones Dawson. She's sitting at the back table back there. Sign up, let her know so we can make sure we schedule what you need as far as training so we can make sure that you are able to actively participate in your data system because we don't directly operate anything and everything you do needs to be in that system so we can verify, validate, and report. So I need 100% participation, all right? So one last thing from all of you. What do you need from us at DFSS? Anything, going once. Yeah, I knew somebody was gonna throw their hands up. Yes, sir. I can barely hear you. You having a cash flow issue? Okay, give that to Angel as well, because she and I, she's um, um, my manager over program admin. I'm working directly with her. She's only been there a short while, but I'm still supporting her in this. Let her know what your issues are so that we can figure out where you are. I will say this. I've got quite a few budget revisions in a queue. It's just been me, so I'm behind. I'm the kind of person who will tell you in a minute what I haven't been able to do, haven't been able to get through all your budget revisions. I was sitting there. And I, was, and I was, I got up and I walked away and I said to somebody, you know, it's time to walk away when you can't read the numbers on the page. And it was 7.30 at night. And I said, okay, I got to stop. And so we're going to get them all done. And she's, I, I requested access so she can support me in getting them done. So we're going to be trying to push them out. Like I said, I'm not going to be here next week. That's not to say that I won't be working over the weekend and make sure I get all of them done. We're trying to get every one of them out of our queue yours because you're with him and then I'm going to come over there yes ma'am it's yes you're under expenditure yes You're not losing anything at this point. I just told you, I, I just threw myself under the bus. It's me. In this case, if there's budget revisions in there, you can't voucher it to Rachel. You can give everybody her name. I know it's me. I've told fiscal it's me. Believe me, fiscal emails me and tells me it's me, which is fine. But I'm trying to get all of them pushed out by the end of the weekend because I'm not going to tell you I'll get them done today because I'm with you half a day. And then I'm in my office and I've got two more meetings and I got meetings all day on Friday. And so in between, I'm trying to get them done and I've asked for someone else's hands in it so that we're not so backed up. The goal is to get them all out of our queue over to fiscal so that they can push them forward. Um, but I do understand that, but please let her know. And let me, I'm saying that to you for this reason. Make sure you tell her your agency name and a contact. So as soon as we push your revision through and we know where it's going, we can ask for an expedited payment for you so that you can get your um, funding out of the queue as well. So please let her know. You're welcome. Who else had a hand up? Yes, sir. Which contract is this? The Head Start? I'm, well, Head Start, Early Head Start, I'm trying to get the revision out of my queue right now so that it's through, so that you, you still have an active contract 
you you can still voucher against that. So even if I finished on the 30th of November, which I'm not, then you still are able to voucher on every dollar that you had in there. The revision only means you're using different budget lines based on where you put your dollars, but you will still have that time at the end of the contract period to still do your vouchers. So you, I'm sorry? Absolutely. Well, what we're trying to do, and I'm here with you today, we went through, not yes, day before yesterday, um, trying to get everything through Office of Head Start so that I can get my notice of award. And so I was literally submitting questions and board documents that people had not, that needed to be corrected on Wednesday so that I could get a notice, a notice of award. They're trying to send me my notice of award right away. I will tell you what we've already done is we've already put into the system what's called an executive approval so that we can begin initiation on those contracts day one. We can get them out of the door. So we're trying to keep things moving. But the December one, it should be starting as soon after as possible because we started the legwork first versus waiting on the NOA. Well, I'm going to tell you as quick as we can get it in, you will be able to get your money out. That's why I'm trying to push things through as quickly as we can. I will tell you, as you know, the later it takes, those, those grant applications from you were September 1. We applied on time. It is taking us until Wednesday of this week to answer all the questions and get all the board docs. And it has to be a 100% everything in the queue before they will approve the, that notice of award and then send it out. It was Wednesday before I got all three submitted and they took it. And it was because some agencies docs were still outstanding, incorrect, wrong signature, signatures didn't match, you know, parent policy names weren't updated in the systems, dot, dot, dot. All of those things had to be right before they would approve it as of Wednesday. All three went back in and he said he had what he needed. That is November, which means if they turn around the notice of award, we will probably get something by the end of this month for an effective date of December 1. Last year, I will tell you, because of the same exact reason as this, we get our we got our notice of award November 30th for December 1. Okay? That's why working so hard to get people to give us everything is so critical because it's it holds up the, the approval from office, office of Head Start. They will not approve until they have all I's dotted and T's crossed. They can't pass it to DC until it's done on our side here in the city. Okay? So I'm hoping as soon as I get a notice of award that everything else can start being pushed out the system. And that's what we're trying for. Okay? Yes, sir. It's, it shouldn't be. And I'm going to explain why. You know what you're, yes, it becomes something about what you're fronting. But at the end of the day, if you know what your plan is, you know what you plan on using, you should be using your money. Okay? If everybody is vouchering monthly, if you're vouchering monthly and, and nobody says you can't voucher weekly, you can voucher weekly, you can voucher multiple times. When it hits a budget revision, that's when it stalls, and I get that. But other than that, if you're constantly vouchering and utilizing your dollars, you get to the bottom here, and there may be a few vouchers left out there, but it shouldn't be 100% of your grant or 70% of your grant. But I know some people, when I'm looking at the document, some people have spent less than 60% which means they got a, either a whole lot of vouchers or they're not going to expend it, okay? And that had nothing to do with the revision. That had to do with the fact of the grant started December 1 of last year. We had November 30th of 2022, and some people spent less than 60% of their grant funds. Well, it, but it depends on cash flow, and I, I just remind every, everybody, and I'm not saying that it works for everyone, but every grant that you sign says that you need to have the ability to operate on a reimbursement basis. And that's what this is, is a reimbursement basis. I will tell you some of the individuals who are working in the fiscal Fridays with Clarendon are coming up with some alternative ways to kind of do some of this. And if we need to do more, we'll do more. Because what I want is everybody to use every dollar. I don't really want to give any dollar back. Um, but I want you not to have to operate where it's not fiscally sound for you either, meaning you're fronting so much that you're barely able to keep your door open. That's not what we want for you. And that's why we're trying to expedite, 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 and trying to get things through the system as quickly as possible. That's why for ECBG, it was really important for us to get that IGA, not in April, like we did before. We pushed to get an IGA before the end of 2023. And I'm going to tell you, since I've been working here, it's the first one I got. It's the first one I got this soon, I'm going to tell you. And it was a push. 
It really was a push to get it, but we have it signed, sealed, and delivered, which means now I can do all of the other things that we pushed out in April, May last year when we were asking you now to add 10% to everybody and give them retro and I, I, all those other things. Now we're giving you time to be able to do that because we're able to activate those contracts and budget revisions on those right now. But it is a budget revision, people. So if you got a voucher, go put it in today before the revision hits the queue. But again, I understand the issue and it is a part of how the city system works. Once you have a budget revision and it won't let you voucher, but I tell people, get your vouchers ready. We say revision done, send through 75 vouchers. Nobody cares. They don't care how many come through. What we care about is that they come through, okay? And so just be prepared to send them all through so you can get your money in your bank account so that you can pay back all those things back to yourself that in some cases you've already had to front. Yes. It, back in the day, it used to be. I like how you said that. Back in the day, you're absolutely right. Back in the day, there was an advance. In today, there isn't. There isn't an advance right now. And I will tell you that there are some budgets and contracts out of the city that they tried to do it, and it has messed up everything in the system, and they've almost lost their funding. I have no interest in anybody losing their funding over something like this, but we definitely want to work with you to make sure you're able to use all your dollars. And I do understand the budget revision issue, how it stalls things in the system, and that's why I don't want to. I don't want it to be us. I'm saying today it is us, but I don't want it to be us. I want to be able to get you in and get you out as quickly as we possibly can. And I think we're on target and on task to be able to. Advisor over the finance team. Yay! And now she has a manager, Angel Jones Dotson. So now not only me, I got two more people. Thank goodness. Y'all need to get out of hand slap. <laughs> it only took us how long to get there. Um, but we're there now where we not only have the ability to do it, but we've got some people to help us get this stuff out quicker. All right. Someone else's hand was on the other side of the room, or am I missing anyone? Yes, ma'am. In the application system, do you have an answer for that? Repeat it one more time. If let me summarize, you said if you had somebody that you didn't, if she declined them and now she wants to enroll them, she's not able to go back to their profile. Call the call the early learning hotline. Call the hotline so that they can pull that profile back in for you. Any other questions from anyone? I hope what you've gotten today has been helpful. Remember that don't forget to register for trainings. There's a lot of trainings out there. Your staff should be registering for them. Everybody should make sure that they know how to use the system so that you are actively in it every day. Every day meaning we are supposed to do attendance every day, right? And so the staff who's required to do that should be in that system every day doing it. But if you're still not able to, you gotta let us know so we can support you through this. So we can move from spreadsheets into a data system. So you can pull reports on your side, we can pull reports on our side, and we won't have to bother you with an Excel spreadsheet anymore. That could be your Christmas present from DFSS if we can get there. All right. So again, thanks everyone for being here. Um, take care of yourself, be safe out there. Um, have a happy Thanksgiving. Um, I didn't get an invite so far from anybody for Thanksgiving dinner, so I guess I'm just gonna have to pick up a turkey at what Popeye's they said they're selling them or something I don't know that's okay everybody have a great time be safe enjoy your family enjoy your friends eat be merry and we'll see you soon